Hey everybody, it's me Amanda with Once in a Wild. Welcome to Once in a Wild Wednesday, where we broadcast every single Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Central Time. Um, and we are broadcasting on YouTube and Facebook. So whether you are a Facebook user or a YouTube subscriber, we very much uh, appreciate you <laughs> checking out our live stream every single Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Without further ado, let us begin. <laughs> Hey everybody, hope your week's going well. It's me, Amanda, with Once in a Wild. If you are here for the very first time, welcome. And if you are a returning follower, friend, or family member, welcome back. And we're happy to see you. Um, it is Once in a Wild Wednesday, so we are ready to get started. And we have some cool um, animals to meet, of course, as usual. We have three animals to meet today, and we are going to talk about our topic at hand, which if you saw um, maybe my post about it earlier on Facebook, or if you maybe read in the description, you'll know what we're talking about. Hello, Ash, it's so good to see you guys. And I'm so glad you're here with us. If you guys have any comments or questions, feel free to type them in down below. Hello, William, good to see you as well. Looks like you are an emu in sunglasses, my favorite kind of bird. <laughs> How did you know? I actually really do love emus. They're one of my favorite animals on the planet. They are an Australian bird and the second largest Australian bird on the continent. The first largest Australian bird is another one of my favorites. It's the cassowary, the world's most dangerous dangerous bird, but the emu is kind of like the close cousin to the cassowary that happens to be a lot nicer. <laughs> so I absolutely love emus. So that is super cute. I'm sure that's from a commercial and I can't remember which commercial that's from. You'll have to remind me what that's from. But if anybody else has any comments they want to uh, fill in in the comments down below, or if you have any questions about the animals or the topic at hand today, of course, please let me know. That is always really fun and we love interacting with you guys. I'm going to check my camera really fast before we get too far in. There we go, wow, we're good to go. Sorry guys, it's been quite the afternoon. However, um, if you guys have any questions whatsoever, you need anything at all, please let me know in the comment section down below and I'll be happy to answer your questions right here on the live stream if I can. And if not, then I will go back in the old fashioned way and actually answer your question by typing in the answer if I just don't see your question in time or if I run out of time, etc. cetera. I was from the Liberty Mutual commercial. Yes, I remember now. The, all those commercials kind of run together for me, but it's super cute. Hello, Jeffrey. I hope you're doing well. You are not an emu. You are um, from American Psycho right now in your, in your profile photo as usual, which is pretty cool. We love cosplay as well here once in a while. Um, but if you have never been here before, my name is Amanda, and I'm the founder and animal specialist here at Once in a Wild, which is our mobile zoo. We are located in San Antonio, Texas, so we can bring the zoo to you in the San Antonio, Texas area and surrounding cities, whether that be for a park a classroom or an animal experience of any kind, please let me know if you're interested in an in-person animal encounter. Yep, we are back in action once again and we can come to you in person with some animals. We do have to wear our mask and make sure and wash our hands, uh, you know, just to be careful and keep our social distancing in mind. But um, we are willing to come to you guys in person if you are interested in that. But we also do provide virtual animal encounters. As you can see right now, we're on a live stream, right? But we can also customize and bring you a virtual animal encounter of your choosing of the animals and the duration of time. We typically start with a one hour presentation. And usually in one hour, you guys can view six to eight animals of your choosing. And those are perfect for classroom presentations, but they're also great just for fun as well. We have a whole bunch of, um, like birthday parties and just, just for the fun of it, office Zooms as well that we've done. We do visit offices in person, but we can also visit you guys um, virtually, of course. We typically jump in a Zoom or whatever platform you prefer, and we bring you guys a whole bunch of really awesome animals. And today you're kind of getting a little preview of that, right? That's what our live streams pretty much are. And we do bring this live stream to you for free of charge, but we do have uh, tipping and donation options as usual. Um, one of those is Venmo, one of those is Cash App, and the last one is PayPal. And we also do have an Amazon wish list, which can be found at once in a wild. Com. Um, you can go to the website and scroll all the way down to the bottom and you'll see that button which leads you to our Amazon wish list. And that's another great way to help us out and donate to our animals. All of our proceeds that we um, do receive from animal encounters as well as donations go to animal care as you guys know. But if you're new, maybe you didn't know that and I wanted to tell you. <laughs> so today we're talking about something kind of fun and that is how we enrich our animals. We're talking about animal enrichment. Now, what is animal enrichment? Well, that can be as simple as uh, a bone for your dog, a toy for your dog, uh, a little toy for your cat. Animal toys are probably the easiest and most 
obvious example of animal enrichment, but animal enrichment can be almost anything. It can be anything that encourages good behavior and discourages um, negative behavior in your animal. So if you have a dog who is chewing on your shoe and you don't really care for that, you can give them a more appropriate toy to chew on instead or teach them not to chew on your shoes, right? But that will give them something else as an option to get that behavior out because chewing for a dog is a natural behavior and chewing for a lot of animals is actually a natural behavior. Birds chew, rodents chew, all sorts of animals chew on stuff. So they have to be able to chew on something. So if you don't provide them with something that's appropriate for them to chew on, they're gonna find something. I, I promise you that. And it might be your shoe or your clothes or something or the trash or something like that. So um, that's a really good and simple uh, example of animal enrichment. I bet you guys can think of other examples of animal enrichment, but enrichment basically just enriches the animal's life, right? And we as humans, we also need enrichment because we can get bored, right? We're, we're pretty smart animals, if I do say so myself, at least most of us are smart animals, right? <laughs> um, but we need something to do or else we can get kind of bored, kind of complacent. Um, a lot of us have games that keep us busy on our phones or we have other humans to interact with. We have TV shows we like to watch. What is your favorite human enrichment? Maybe you guys can tell me what your favorite enrichment is for your pets and for yourself. Uh, some of my favorite enrichment is just getting outside and enjoying nature, walking around. We don't get outside too much anymore, right? But it's important to still get out and walk around your neighborhood, maybe go to the park or go to the zoo, um, just to kind of get out and get some fresh air as much as we can with a mask on, right? <laughs> so, but there's a lot of things that can enrich our lives. And we also have to keep that in mind with our animals. And when we have over 70 animals, like we do here at Once in a Wild, we do have to keep that in mind here as well. And all zoos across everywhere um, should and usually do have enrichment plans for their animals or at least provide enrichment for their animals. And enrichment can be things other than objects or toys. It can also be activities or training, but we are specifically going to talk about objects that can be enrichment for our animals. So what I'm gonna do, it's gonna be a lot of fun and this is a little bit different than our usual kind of program where I just show you the animal and talk about them. So what I'm gonna do today is show you the enrichment items first and then I'll bring out the animal as I usually do and talk about the animal one by one. Does that sound fun? Hello, Clay, it's nice to see you. Everybody stop what you're doing and make sure that you go and follow The Wild Side with Clay on YouTube. Subscribe to their YouTube channel because we are guests on that YouTube channel. That's right, once in a while and yours truly and Clay <laughs> are doing a, a video over there and we already did a chameleon video, but there's another video coming up very, very shortly. So make sure you subscribe to the Wild Side with Clay, and also check him out over on Instagram. And you can also check us out on Instagram if you haven't already. We are at Once in a Wild Zoo. Um, and yeah, check out this uh, endeavor as well, all over the social medias, <laughs> and especially YouTube, where you can see those full length videos. They're really fun. Clay's a wonderful person, and we are collaborating quite a bit. So keep uh, stay tuned for uh, seeing some of the animals you know and love on some of Clay's videos, where he can talk about them and teach you guys about them. Okay, Ricardo's favorite enrichment is exercise. Yes, for sure. Uh, Ricardo does like to work out and exercise. I can attest to that. And art, um, so drawing and uh, any kind of art. Um, one of my favorite activities is also photography. Photography is a, a very enriching activity for me. Um, not only does it kind of help me to get out into nature if I'm taking nature photos or zoo photos or something like that. It also um, gives me a project to do as if I need anything else to do these days. But still, it gives me a, a fun project that I can relax and sit down and edit the photos. That is relaxing for me and I really enjoy having that final product to kind of show everybody. Photography was actually my first endeavor as a career path, believe it or not. When I was younger, um, I first went to school for photography and I changed my mind and changed my major to zoology way later. <laughs> um, and I'm glad I did, but photography is very, um, very important to me as well. And it's kind of my, my fun time now. And then Ricardo also says um, skateboarding, which is another form of exercise, right? Skateboarding can be very enriching and fun. Um, one of my favorite activities, I don't do this very often anymore, is horseback riding or just being around animals in general, right? Horses are one of my first loves as a uh, an animal that I was um, either a professional with or just having fun being around. Horses were kind of one of the first animals that I, um, was around, uh, uh, you know, more than like one, more than, what am I trying to say, guys? More than like every now and then. <laughs> I was a huge horse person back in the old days, <laughs> back in the old days when I was young. 
Uh, Ash says, we like to take walks and bike ride and we love to watch your show. That is so nice. I'm so glad that I can be enriching to some of y'all's lives. Um, we certainly try <laughs> to do that. Um, every single show, we try to have a lot of fun, right? And teach you guys some fun information. Um, how many of you guys have learned something new each and every time? I know I'm always learning. So that's one of my favorite parts about this job. And of course, working with all the wonderful animals. So let me show you guys some enrichment more than once in a wild crickets. No, <laughs> no, that's pretty funny. Okay, all right. So let me show you some of the enrichment items that I have brought for this first animal species. So we have three animal species to meet today. Three, three, we have three animal species and our first animal is going to benefit from all different types of enrichment. But, oh, you guys are wonderful. We learn something new every show. That is so great wonderful i love it so here's one um enrichment item for this first animal this is a well it's a ball right but it's made out of timothy hay and all sorts of natural materials like that so this enrichment item can be chewed on chewed on chewed on that's not a word chewed on it can be eaten so this is technically an edible item for this first animal species and uh, by the way, some of the enrichment items I'm showing today can apply to other animals, not just the species that I brought, but let's see if you guys can maybe guess what animal we're gonna talk about. So this one's a Timothy grass and hay ball. It's made out of like a rope out of all those items. So that's really cool. It can roll around and the animals can see something, uh, you know, rolling around and just kind of look at it. It can be fun to chase around, but they can also chew on it and actually consume and eat it, right? Consume and eat is the same thing, Amanda. So this is another, item here. This is actually a part of an antler. And this is technically a dog chew toy. Um, however, my dogs didn't really care for this particular chew. So I ended up regifting it to another animal. Well, you know, animals share it here around, uh, here, around here once in a while. We have several enrichment items that can go to several animals, right? But for this um, animal type, it's another chewing item. So this is part of an antler. And uh, this particular animal can chew on it. So it is a chewing type animal, right? So the other one can be chewed chewed on and rolled around and uh, messed with in general and also eaten. This one isn't really eaten, but they could chew on it to help them do something specific. And uh, it can also be like a new fun texture. It's kind of rough and very solid. This can go to several animals that are more destructive, like the ferrets. Ferrets are very challenging to enrich sometimes and larger birds and things like that because they're very destructive and they can destroy things. But antler is really tough. If a dog, you know, chews on it, you know it's tough. Here's another few items. These are all the same thing, but they are willow sticks. This is another item that can be chewed on, obviously, and they can also be, you know, pick up sticks, you could drop them. I'm not going to do it now, but <laughs> you could drop them and they can roll around and make a big mess. Some, sometimes animals like to pick up things and, and throw them around. This is a, a safe item that they could do that with. And remember, when we're enriching our animals or ourselves, we have to make sure that things are safe, that the animal safety is in mind, right? And that it's appropriate for the animal. So these are willow sticks. They can be chewed on. They can be eaten by certain kinds of animals. That should be a clue right there. And they can generally just like kind of mess with them and toss them around, like I said. This is kind of a homemade item. And I know a lot of you guys are in the same boat as us where you get a lot of cardboard boxes these days. Um, we get a ton of Amazon orders and Chewy orders and all kinds of stuff. But this is just from a piece of cardboard. It looks like it was from some mineral water, Italian mineral water <laughs> from a grocery store pickup, I'm sure, or Costco pickup. Costco's doing well these days. So we get a lot of cardboard boxes. Cardboard boxes themselves can be great hides for animals. They can be great for animals to get up, get up in and cozy up in like a cat. Cats really like boxes, right? If I fits, I sits. <laughs> That's very famous for cats. Um, but all kinds of animals, not just your house cats, uh, will cozy up in a box. Our ferrets really like boxes. Almost every animal likes boxes. I can't really think of any animal off the top of my head that doesn't like boxes in some capacity. They may be indifferent to them, but boxes are awesome enrichment. And you might be thinking, well, that's kind of lame, but animals really like cardboard. And this particular animal can also chew on the cardboard. They can pick them up. This is another safe item to just kind of toss around. <laughs> and uh, it's not dangerous to them or other roommates that they might be living with, which gives you a hint. And uh, they can generally chew it up. And it's inexpensive, right? Dare I say cheap enrichment, homemade enrichment. So what I've done is just cut these up, 
into little sections and I just folded them back and forth as you can see. And that's a great enrichment item for a lot of animals, but for one in particular. And there's one last one that I brought for this particular animal. And that is a good old fashioned paper bag. That's right, folks, a paper bag. So all these items are very inexpensive, if not homemade. So there's really no excuse to not enrich your, your animals at home, right? We want to make sure that all those animals at home as well are staying enriched too in your lives. <laughs> That's very important to me to teach you guys that. Um, we don't just talk about wildlife and their adaptations. We talk about pet care and animal care in general. That's what we're talking about today. This is a good old fashioned, great big paper bag. And I folded it over like this, right? I just folded it over so they could get up in there and hide. Like I talked about the box hide. Boxes can be cut up into different shapes so animals can hide inside of them. Now we wanna make sure that it's appropriately sized for the animal that you're enriching. Um, we wanna make sure they can't get their head stuck in there. Whoa! Right? I probably have hay all over me now. You're welcome. So we wanna make sure they can't get their head stuck in there. We wanna make sure um, that they can't get their body parts stuck in there. One nice thing about paper though, is it can usually be broken up. So if they do get something stuck in there, they can usually tear it open in there, okay. But that's something to keep in mind for like boxes or more rigid items, is we gotta make sure animals aren't getting stuck in them or they're appropriately sized in general. But that's just using your common sense, right? But keep that in mind. But this is a good old fashioned paper bag. We have a paper bag. Let's put the stuff in while we talk about it. We had the the Timothy Hay rope ball. <laughs> oh my, you guys. What I do for you guys is, is a lot of work. Okay, and then we have the, the cardboard piece that I've modified a little bit, right? It's kind of like a little puzzle piece for them to chew on and toss around and just like, there's that. Get in there. We have all these willow sticks, which are pretty awesome. They can be eaten or chewed on or tossed around or rolled around. Same thing with that ball too. And then we have the antler, of course. So what animal do you think that we would use all these items for? Does anybody have any guesses? Remember, they can be used for different animal species. It's not just one animal species, but I brought one today that can definitely benefit from, haha, <laughs> they can definitely benefit from uh, all those things. So let's see what your guesses are. Richard is here. Hello, Richard. It's good to see you once again. Uh, Richard says, makes me kind of want to chew on a willow stick. Well, we all got to take care of our teeth. And uh, I don't know if chewing on a willow stick is necessarily recommended by the American Dent Association <laughs> or any dentist. Uh, but uh, that is funny. You are silly. Biodegradable. Yeah, all these items. They're all natural, right? That's something to keep in mind as well with your enrichment items. Either, I mean, maybe consider going green with your enrichment for your animal. That's a great thing to bring up. Thanks, Ricardo. Um, we could talk about, well, reusable items. Lots and lots of enrichment items are not reusable. Like these are sometimes reusable if they don't get too soiled or too damaged. But typically the items I just showed you are gonna get used up. However, they're biodegradable. So even if there's some remaining of this cardboard, that can probably go in the biodegradable trash if your area picks up biodegradable or organic trash, right? And certainly, you know, the willow, Timothy bundle here, all the things, those, those are all biodegradable. So that is great. Um, and a lot of the items that we buy for our animals might be plastic, but they're reusable or they might be made of other materials, which I'm gonna show you in a little bit. But a lot of the items I brought today are certainly biodegradable. Thank you for noticing. What are things for a rabbit? Are we playing Jeopardy today? Um, <laughs> RIP Alex Trebek, we love you. Um, so you are very close, very, very close. And yes, every single one of those items could definitely be used for a rabbit. Absolutely, those could all be for rabbits. Good guess. Hmm, do you guys have any other guesses? You're very close. It is not a rabbit or lagomorph. It is another type of animal, which we often see sometimes on the show. What do y'all think? I'll give you a couple of seconds while we maybe learn more about enrichment. But it's really important to enrich your animals' lives because of course um, they can get a little bored just like we can, like we talked about before. Um, they need items to maybe wear their teeth down and keep healthy with their dentation, their teeth. Um, that is very important for this animal. Ferret is a very, very good guess. And two of you guessed ferret. That is a good guess. It is not the ferret. 
So some of these items could go to the ferret, but a lot of these items, if I gave them to the ferret, they would be destroyed in like two seconds. Um, so it's another type of animal. Hmm, I think Richard knows. Absolutely, what are? Things for a guinea pig. So yes, I brought noodles to meet you guys today, or to see you guys again. You've met him before, I'm sure. Sorry, you guys, I gotta check my camera sometimes. Okay, so yes, guinea pig, you are correct. Very, very good, you have been paying attention. So guinea pigs have to chew on things to keep their teeth worn down because they're rodents. And guinea pigs need to eat hay. Um, about 85 to 90% of their diet is actually Timothy hay or orchard hay or grass. You win, you win, you win. Top fan, top fan. All of you guys are our top fans. I take it back. Okay, Noodles is here today to see you guys. It's been a minute since Noodles has been on the live stream. Here he is. Isn't he just so cute? I'm going to rearrange him really quick. Oh. Noodles. So Noodles is here and Noodles is an Abyssinian guinea pig. He's like, can I play with all those toys? Maybe later. Maybe later. We have to talk about you first. So this of course is Noodles the guinea pig. We have four guinea pigs here at Once in a Wild and they are all males. Uh, male guinea pigs are called boars just like a pig is called a boar. Isn't that cool? And a group of guinea pigs is called a herd. That's right. Just like a herd of horses, a herd of deer, or a herd of pigs. <laughs> <laughs> Ricardo says, potent potables for 500. Maybe we'll continue our, our Jeopardy theme sometime and we'll do a game show sometime on the live stream. That'll be a lot of fun. But I'm glad you guys guessed. Um, you didn't guess on the first try, but that is okay. So this is noodles. Now the guinea pig is not from Guinea, nor is it a pig. <laughs> Pigs do need a lot of enrichment too, but rodents like guinea pigs need enrichment as well. And for many different reasons. So rodents have to chew to keep their teeth worn down. Both um, sets of incisors on the top and the bottom. They have two on the top and two on the bottom that never stop growing. And therefore they have to keep chewing on hay, which is their diet, right? In the, in, in the nature, in the wild or in nature, they would chew on grass, on their vegetation that they eat because they are herbivores and they would graze on grass most of the time and that would help keep their teeth worn down. And in the care of humans, like I said, they get hay and that helps to keep their teeth worn down, but they also need enrichment to chew on. We always provide them with chew toys or cardboard or something like that, that they can chew on whenever they want to and help their teeth to stay nice and healthy. If their teeth keep growing, they will actually continuously grow and grow right out of their mouth. And that is not good for them, is it? It wouldn't be very comfortable or um, allow them to eat very well. So that wouldn't be good. Donna says, hi. Hi, Donna. Nice to see you. What do you think of Noodles? Isn't he adorable? Noodles is a type of guinea pig called an Abyssinian. And there are many, many uh, different breeds of guinea pig. And they all originate from a species which comes from South America. So they're not from Guinea, like the name says, nor are they a pig. Now, where that name comes from, is they used to cost one guinea back when they were brought over to Europe from South America as pets. Um, the Incas actually originally domesticated guinea pigs over 5,000 years ago, and they were originally domesticated for food purposes. Don't tell noodles. Um, but of course, he's not going to be used for food purposes. He's one of our animal ambassadors and animal friends here at Once in a Wild. He's getting a little wiggly with me. I'm gonna rearrange him in my hands. He's a busybody sometimes. Now, um, and also where the name pig comes from is because they squeal like pigs. That is the going theory on that. But they have been domesticated for over 5,000 years and I wasn't around 5,000 years ago. I don't think I was. So I'm not 100% sure how they got the name guinea pig. However, we think it's because they make squealing noises and guinea pigs are very social. They do make lots of sounds, right? And th that includes squeals, purrs, grunts, all kinds of sounds, don't you? And they're very social. So another thing that can enrich their lives is having another friend guinea pig, or at least um, be in the same room with other guinea pigs so they can socialize in some way. Ash says we have an Abyssinian cat. Yeah, there are different Abyssinian animals. <laughs> there are Abyssinian ground hornbills. There's Abyssinian, there's all kinds of Abyssinian things. I can't think of any more at the top of my head right now, but there's many breeds um, that are Abyssinian too. And th these guys have really wacky hair. They look like they're wearing mohawks or faux hawks all the time. And his coloration is known as a tortoise shell, kind of like a tortoise shell cat. If you've ever seen one of those, what color is your cat, Ash? I don't imagine it's a tortoise shell, but I'm not really sure. How long have we had Noodles? Noodles is around uh, a year and some change. Um, we've had him for around a year now. We have Noodles and um, Billy Joe. Those two are actually brothers and they are the same age from the same litter. And then we have Dexter who's around uh, a year old as well. 
And then our final guinea pig is Iggy, and he's actually a um, Peruvian guinea pig, and he has really long, straight hair, and he is a neat guinea pig to see. <laughs> Hello, Amanda. So good to see you once again. It's been a minute since we saw you. We've got noodles out here so far. We're talking about animal enrichment. So we brought out a bunch of enrichment items for guinea pigs. Now, that's just one animal that we can enrich, right? What do you guys have to say about noodles? Now, what was I talking about? Oh, they're very social. So they live in groups together. So it's really important for them to have each other. Otherwise, they're not really very happy. So that is one, um, another way to enrich their lives is by keeping them in social groups called herds. I guess he's more comfortable down here like this. That's okay. Okay. Thank you for tagging some of your friends, Amanda. Uh, another free way to help us out is by subscribing to our YouTube channel, liking the videos, commenting on the videos, of course, as well as uh, following us on all of our social media. All of our social media links can be found at onceinawild.com and uh, tagging your friends that you might think are interested in animal programs or in any of these live streams or animal videos. Noodles, you did a great job. You're getting a little wiggly with me today and that is okay. Animals have the right to move around, right? They're alive, <laughs> but they're wonderful animals. So a lot of people aren't aware um, that there are many, many different types of rodents. And um, this is just one of them. And I forgot to mention that the original species that the guinea pigs actually come from is known as the cavey. It's the wild cavey in South America. And the original species is unfortunately now extinct in the wild. But there are many other species that are really similar to that species still living and thriving in the wild. And think of a squirrel or a great big hamster, I guess. But think of a squirrel with no tail. And that is kind of what a wild cavey looks like. They have a little bit longer legs than our friend Noodles here. They have certainly have shorter hair that is more brown. And uh, if you're familiar with like the gray squirrels that we have in Texas, that is what their color kind of looks like. It's kind of a mixed um, black and brown and gray. So they can blend into stuff <laughs> with camouflage. They certainly don't look like this in the wild, right? No. <laughs> and uh, they are going to have much shorter, sleeker fur to stay nice and cool in South America where they're from. And uh, there are many different species of cavey, which is a type of rodent. But rodents are, of course, other animals like squirrels, hamsters, guinea pigs, of course, rats, mice, porcupines are rodents too. There's all sorts of rodents out there in the world. And they all have something in common, which is their teeth. Remember, they have to chew on stuff to keep their teeth worn down. He wants to chew on me. He's just giving me some little love nibbles. Um, but these guys have to um, chew on items such as wood, antlers. Believe it or not, rodents in the wild do seek out bones and antlers to chew on sometimes. A famous animal that chews on bones is actually the porcupine. Porcupines in Africa for... For example, I do know this, um, those guys will actually look for bones to chew on and that will help to wear their teeth down. That's very enriching to them. Now that is not a carnivorous animal. It is an herbivore. So they don't eat other animals, but they might chew on hard bones. They might chew on antlers to be able to wear their teeth down and keep them worn down. Another thing that porcupines do as a survival technique is actually leaving bones littered all around their den. So a porcupine will actually have bones, wait, Porcupine will have a den <laughs> underground or partially underground, like a little cave, right? In the side of the, maybe in the side of a hill or underground, something like that. They'll have a den that they can go in and shelter in it in the daytime usually because a porcupine is typically crepuscular or nocturnal. Um, so they're, it's, it's safer to be out in the cover of darkness for a African porcupine anyway. But typically porcupines of that nature on the ground, they have somewhere to go underground. So uh, around their den, which is that little underground hole they have, um, they will litter bones around that area to help to kind of ward off enemies. Because if a predator or any animal comes around, they might think, oh my gosh, there's a scary monster that lives here that eats animals and the bones are everywhere. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. And the bones are everywhere. I think I surprised him really quick. Sorry about that noodle. The bones are kind of littered around the, the area of the den and that will actually um, kind of ward away enemies, if that makes sense. That wouldn't make any, any sense today. Do they bite you? Um, guinea pigs, they can bite, but their bites are typically very, very gentle. I didn't mean to scare him. Sorry about that, noodles. I'm sorry. They don't really bite hard. Um, guinea pigs are less inclined to bite than many other rodent pet type animals. And these, by the way, are fully domesticated. They've been domesticated for over 5,000 years. So they are accustomed to human companionship. So they make actually very good pets. As long as you meet all their needs, you have to give them lots of enrichment. They're very messy animals. So they need to be cleaned up all the time. And they need to have uh, friends of the same species around. 
Um, but when they do bite, I mean, it could hurt sometimes, but they're not inclined to bite like other rodents are, like hamsters, for example. Those guys do bite a lot. So I've never been bitten seriously by a guinea pig ever. Yes, a good question. Is it better to have one or two guinea pigs since they are so social? Yes, it's always better for them to have a friend. Um, there are certain guinea pigs that don't like other guinea pigs, just like there are dogs that don't like other dogs, but it's always important to give them that chance first and um, to try it out. And they have to at least have, in my opinion, like another guinea pig around. That way they can at least hear each other because they're very social and they're also prey. So they feel a little bit um, vulnerable if they are not in a group or a herd together, right? Are you looking for snacks? Is that what your problem is today? Do they have a tail? Whoop. Do they like to be picked up? It depends on the guinea pig. I found that Iggy is probably our friendliest guinea pig of all of them. He's also the oldest. And the older they get, the more tolerant they get because they start learning that humans are okay. Um, the younger the guinea pig, in my experience, the more skittish they are. But Noodles is doing well right now, right? And uh, do they have a tailbone? That's a good question. I believe they do, but they do not have a tail. They're a, one of the few animals that does not have a true tail. They have no tail whatsoever. It's just a bum. <laughs> so no tail at all. How long is the guinea pig's life expectancy? So their lifespan, meaning that like the record of guinea pig, I think is like 12, but uh, that is not typical of a guinea pig. Typically it's around seven or eight. That is a nice long life for a guinea pig. They don't live uh, too long of a life, but they also don't have too short of a life either. They're kind of medium for a rodent. So I would say anywhere from five to eight. Okay, noodles, I understand. Are you ready to be put down? So it really depends on the personality of your guinea pig as far as their tolerance of humans and things like that. Now he's looking for snacks in there. Um, he, as far as their tolerance of humans, um, they can be trained, but guinea pigs in general are kind of skittish animals, but they can learn to really um, tolerate human handling a lot because they are domesticated. And since they are a social animal by nature, they tend to do pretty well in human care. The most challenging thing with guinea pigs, in my opinion, is that initial first time that you pick them up. And I don't mean the first time ever. I mean, every time you pick them up, they do kind of tend to run off, but that's just how a guinea pig is. And once they realize that everything's okay, then they're, they're fine being held or held in the lap. Guinea pigs like to be held in like kind of in your lap. Um, not like the way I was holding him, but the best way to bond with your guinea pig, if you have one or you want one, is to put them like on a blanket in your lap. That way they have a nice flat surface and they seem to do better that way because they're not an animal that would ever go up high. <laughs> so heights is kind of their, their downfall. I didn't even mean to joke around about that. Um, heights is not their forte, I should say. Um, so they don't climb. So having a flat surface to just kind of sit on is a little bit more ideal. If that makes sense. That is a good question. You guys are doing fabulous. I'm going to show you some more enrichment items. So we learned all about guinea pig enrichment. Let's learn about another animal, shall we? I'm going to throw that over there. <laughs> this is real life, you guys. You guys are being so wonderful and patient as usual. And I hope you're enjoying the show so far so good, right? I'm going to give myself a little enrichment right here. Water isn't really enrichment. That's kind of a necessity, right? But food can also be an enrichment. So let's learn about some food enrichment. I think that would be a cool idea. So not necessarily food in of itself, but maybe like new foods that your animal doesn't get every day, like treat items, right? That can be very enriching to a lot of animals across the spectrum. Most animals like to eat food, right? <laughs> and um, myself included, that might be one of my favorite enrichments is food. <laughs> um, but many animals also enjoy food, right? So let me show you some of that. Okay, some of these items are gonna be food and some are not. So let me show you the ones that are not first. This is gonna throw you off. So <clears throat> we have one, two, three bowls. These are just regular plastic bowls. Now we did talk about biodegradable items. This is not one of them, but this is certainly a item that you could reuse. We have a green bowl, a red bowl, and a yellow bowl, right? These are just fun plastic bowls, very inexpensive. You could probably find these at Walmart or anywhere like that, thrift store, wherever. And they're just regular old plastic bowls. So for this animal coming up, I would probably present them face down on a flat surface for them to kind of push around and just kind of enjoy as something new in the environment. Environment, environmental enrichment is what I meant to say. So the, these animals can push around things. That is a strange item, right? But it does work and it's very durable. This animal certainly needs very, very durable items. 
or something that they can eat or something that will not break easily. So that's your hint there. So we have our three plastic bowls. The more durable, the better. We have another very durable bowl coming up. This is a dog water dish that is turned upside down. You can see it's just a regular metal water bowl. This is one of those like non-tip metal bowls. These are very, very tough and durable. A lot of animals can enjoy these metal bowls or at least we hope they enjoy them, right? <laughs> we can we can give them to them. Um, ferrets can get metal bowls. That is not a problem for them. They're very destructive, but this is not a ferret item because there's a bunch of vegetables in there. <laughs> so we're talking about an animal that eats vegetables today um, or this time, I should say. And this is grass. There are weeds in there. This animal does eat weeds and grass. Now the guinea pig could get this enrichment. The guinea pig could probably get the plastic too, but I, I venture to say that plastic isn't the best choice for guinea pigs because they could chew on it and possibly maybe consume part of the plastic. So I don't typically offer them plastic, but the metal is probably fine because that's very, very tough. I don't think they'd be able to destroy that <laughs> on their teeth. Um, but there are vegetables in there like natural grasses and weeds. And that is something I don't recommend that you guys feed your animals unless you are 100% sure that you do not use pesticides on your grass and your weeds outside. Um, we do not in our backyard. So I can feed um, our rabbit and some of the other animals um, natural grass and weeds from the yard. So we have plastic bowls and then this metal bowl with some Yummy, delicious, natural grasses. Here's another example of a couple of weeds that I pulled today. Delicious. This animal eats this type of item <laughs> as I make a huge mess in here. Um, but that is for me to worry about, not you guys. But this is a, a nice, healthy snack for a lot of animals, including guinea pigs, rabbits, and another animal and others as well. Not just the animal I'm talking about today. Remember, this can be several animals, so you have many, many choices. And then sometimes we just give them like foods they don't normally get, like these peppers. These aren't really, really spicy peppers, but this animal could get spicy peppers. Um, did you guys know that birds, for example, really enjoy or seem to enjoy um, spicy peppers? They have a totally different palate than us, so spicy doesn't really register for them. Most birds don't have a great sense of smell, so that works. That, that makes sense for me. It makes sense to me, my brain. And then like a banana. This animal could eat the whole banana if they wanted to with the peel and everything, or we could maybe slice this up and mush it up, put it on some things. We could even get really creative, maybe with our metal bowl. We could have this metal bowl, and then we could have maybe some of the banana. You could cut this up into pieces. You know how smushy and gross banana can be? And we could like smear it right here. Maybe they could just have some of the banana that way, and that's just something fun. So what do you guys think that that might be? A beaver? I didn't know we had a beaver here once in a while. We do have rodents and that is a great example of a rodent. And we already met a rodent today who was noodles, <laughs> right? So beavers are actually in the rodent family. And one of my favorite examples, that I'm really shocked that I didn't bring up earlier with our rodent list that I was listing, but beavers have huge bucky teeth that they have to keep worn down. That is a good guess. I'm not sure a beaver could have plastic. I'm pretty sure a beaver would chew right through this. Now we are talking about another potential chewing animal. And we got our plastic bowls. That's a better color for the for the lights. Um, so we it is a chewing type animal potentially, but not like how you think. What do you guys think? It is a vegetarian type animal. Hmm, a bird. That is a good good guess. It is not a bird in this case, but a bird could maybe have this. I wouldn't necessarily give plastic to many birds, though, depending on the bird. Small birds could probably have plastic just fine, but large macaws and things like that probably can't have this. So not a bird in this case. Something that eats grass. So this is an animal. This is a good guess. Iguana is a great guess, and you're very close. It is another type of animal that eats grass. Now an iguana might eat the leaves of trees because they live in the trees. But what animal do you think naturally eats grass besides a rabbit and besides a guinea pig? And we don't have any goats here at once in a wild. Yeah, what do you think? What do you think? Richard's getting there. there you're starting to eliminate the animals in your head. Those of you that have been following us for a while, bearded dragon is a very good guess. You could possibly give this to a bearded dragon for enrichment. Why not? That would be fun. They like to eat vegetables, but this is an animal that only eats vegetables. And bearded dragons also eat other animals too. They're omnivores. So this is a herbivore, a cow. 
We can call this the cow of the reptile world. Does that give you guys enough of a hint? I think it does. I think it gives it right away. Yeah. And uh, Richard is giving you another hint here. Slowly. So what animal do we think it is? Hmm. He's ready to eat some of this grass. So we should let him. Hmm. We'll let him later. You don't want to be shellfish and give someone else a try? Now do you guys know what it is? That is so sweet of you. <laughs> what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? A, a bona fide turtle. Not a turtle. It is a reptile. It looks like a turtle. Hooray! <laughs> we did it! <laughs> you guys got there slowly, just like tortoises, right? Tortoises are slow. Turtles are fast. Let's meet him. Yes, so it is today. It's Shelton. Shelton's here today. So all those items, yes, were intended for our friend Shelton John, the red-footed tortoise. Um, so yes, the grasses, the weeds, the metal bowl is, is fine for tortoises. They can get those for water bowls or just pushing them around or to be fed in or something new and something different, maybe shiny to be looking at. Uh, tortoises do see their own reflections and respond to them. So they might be able to see their reflections in the mirror in the mirror of the metal bowl. That would be kind of cool. Um, they also very much respond to color. So those plastic bowls are different colors and that might um, give them different responses. Um, they can push them around with no danger to them. Now with tortoises, remember we have to be very careful because they have very strong bites. Now Shelton is not gonna bite me and he's a very nice tortoise, but they have strong beaks just like a big bird would have. So we have to make sure none of those items that he can consume unless we want him to consume them, right? Like the vegetation or the peppers, those are okay for him to eat. But if we give him a bunch of paper, uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but I don't really recommend it because tortoises could look at something and say, hmm, that looks like food. So instead of paper, shredded paper or cardboard, we could give him like hay and uh, vegetation or hard plastic. Now some tortoises that are bigger than Shelton may not be able to have those plastic bowls because they are too strong. But Shelton's bite isn't really that strong. Red-footed tortoises like him don't really have the strongest bite of all the tortoises. If it were for, uh, per se a um, maybe like a Galapagos tortoise or even a sulcata tortoise, some of those bigger ones, I wouldn't necessarily give them any plastic at all because they could certainly break it and possibly eat it. And that would be a terrible idea. So I don't wanna encourage you guys to give all your tortoises at home if you have them or if you have tortoises in your care, maybe you work at a zoo or an aquarium that has tortoises, etc., or you have friends that have them. I don't really encourage you guys to give them plastic per se without supervision. So we wanna make sure that our, our animals are not consuming items they shouldn't be, right? But all the other items like metal um most of the time and uh, the edible items are great for tortoises and they really appreciate new snacks snacks are his favorite thing to be enriched with right shelton so shelton if you haven't met him before and i'm pretty sure you guys have that are commenting you said tortoise three times oh yeah there it is maybe i got your comments late good job william i didn't see it until late but there it is you did great all of you guys are winners winner winner chicken dinner. Um, but yes, this is a red-footed tortoise. Absolutely. Very, very good. Um, Shelton John is a young red-footed tortoise, and uh, he is a species also found in South America, just like the guinea pig. Isn't that neat? I didn't even do that on purpose today. I wanted to bring a variety of animals that you may not think of when thinking of enrichment or making their lives more interesting and more exciting. One thing that Shelton really likes to do as well, I think he likes to, of course, you can't tell me, Tell me what you like, Shelton. I wish they could tell us, that way we knew what they liked the most. Um, but what he seems to respond really well to as well is going outside and tortoises really benefit from having some natural sun. As long as it's around 60 degrees and up, he can go outside and get some sun and maybe enjoy a little bit of rain if it's raining or get some fresh grass to eat right off of the ground. And they really enjoy that too. So uh, Shelton actually lives outside most of the year, but it's a little bit too cold still overnight um, right now, this time of year. So he has been living inside with his best friend, Frank, and uh, Joanna the Iguana is also indoors too right now. But they will shortly, hopefully soon, be going outside again as long as it's warm overnight. Has to be over 60 degrees for these guys. But that is also very important for reptiles in general. It's getting the proper sun or lighting, of course, proper diet too. So all those items that I showed you are a perfectly acceptable part of a red-footed tortoise's diet. Now we don't typically overdo it with banana and other fruits like that um, because they can have a lot of sugar in them. So we don't wanna overdo it with the sugar. However, 
just a fun fact for you guys, the tortoises use the restroom sometimes. So sometimes I gotta be aware of that. However, he does really like fruits and fruits are okay in small doses for a species like a red-footed tortoise. Most tortoises can have fruits sometimes, but red-footed tortoises especially do eat fruit in their natural environment. So it's not as big of a deal to feed them more fruit than other tortoises, right? Um, because they're not like a desert species or anything like that. But tortoise, uh, sorry, <laughs> but um, fruits in general do have quite a bit of sugar. So you have to just watch that or else they can get a little bit chunky or just not get the proper nutrients that they're supposed to get. A little turtle wax for what? Oh, for the enrichment? Mm, I'm not sure if I recommend turtle wax for a tortoise. <laughs> Yes, Ash says the iguanas fall from the trees when it gets too cold in Miami. Yeah, iguanas don't belong in Miami. They actually aren't adapted to handle the cold winters, which is kind of rare in Miami. But when it does happen, all those iguanas will fall right out of the trees because they've gotten too cold and their bodies have basically like shut down because it got too cold and they're, they're cold-blooded animals. And uh, they're from Central and South America where it doesn't really get too, too cold, right? But they're an invasive species to Florida. Do they require care for their shells or general hygiene? Yes, we actually soak our tortoises periodically when they need them. Um, this is a tropical species. Like I think I mentioned already, they're from tropical South America. I'm just going to hold him with a towel, you guys. This is real life. Um, they are from tropical Central and South America. <laughs> That's to catch any unwanted things if you get my drift. Um, but yes, we do soak them at least once or twice a week um, to help with humidity in their skin and shells. And I actually use a little bit of olive oil on their skin and shells as well to keep them nice and healthy because this is a species that would normally live in a high humidity area. And South Texas isn't really that high in humidity, so we have to compensate that way. Sorry to use the towel, but that's just the way it is right now. What do they do with the bowls? So they might shove them around and push them around. I can show you. And maybe I will try to get like a video so I can show you guys. But imagine the bowls in different colors. So maybe he's going to respond to different colors in different ways. And we can notate that and study the animals. Um, enriching animals is another way that we can actually study animals too. So when I was a zookeeper, and even now, um, we would notate the animal's interaction with the enrichment to take notes. And that's actually a scientific study of the animal's behavior. Isn't that cool? So we can see if tortoises respond more to red, green, or yellow. But you would basically like kind of lay the, the bowls down like this on a flat surface and they would kind of nose them around and move them around just kind of like a little toy. They might try to nibble on them here and there. Maybe they flip them over, but it's not going to hurt them. So it's just something new in their environment, if that makes sense. They might be like, hmm, what is that? Might shove them around. They might just look at them. You might sniff them. <laughs> you could even put like maybe fruit juice on them or some kind of smell from a food. Maybe they would go up and smell it. That's pretty cool, right? There's all sorts of different creative options that you can um, do and, and um, incorporate into your animal enrichment. The sky's the limit, you guys. As long as it's safe for the animal and appropriately sized and, and appropriate for that animal and it makes sense, go for it. In my opinion, there's so many ideas of enrichment. In fact, there's like limitless ideas. Pretty neat. He is so cute. Well, we are going to let him rest and we'll move on to our final animal. And I'll see if you have any questions about enrichment for the end or at the end. <laughs> and uh, we'll move on. Okay, you guys. I'm going to show you a couple of in, uh, items for our last animal. Say bye, Shelton. You did fantastic and you're beautiful and handsome as always. Okay. Good job, Shelton. And did you know that reptiles need enrichment too? Now, um, in my opinion, some animals kind of require daily enrichment. All animals require daily enrichment of some kind, whether it be, you know, just kind of rearranging things in their habitat sometimes, or maybe presenting their food in new ways. But for example, like a snake or a tarantula may become stressed out if you move things around too much or if you feed them in a new way. So it really just depends on the animal. Um, but animals that especially need a lot of enrichment are like mammals, birds, some reptiles, tortoises are pretty intelligent, lizards are pretty intelligent, and really any animal can benefit from some enrichment. Our animals here at once in a while travel a lot. So that's um, a, a big deal for them. They get a lot of environmental change. Um, they also get handled quite a bit, which is also a nice enriching, we hope, <laughs> um, activity for them and getting out and getting some exercise, maybe getting outside where they wouldn't have otherwise and things like that. So those are all options for enrichment. So here's our final set of items. I'm really going to throw you out guys off this time. We met a mammal, we met a reptile. 
what's our final animal? I wonder what it might be. So here is a nice homemade item. It's a toilet paper roll <laughs> stuffed with packing paper that I've shredded up, as you can see. So I basically um, cut up the packing paper in small little strips and then I crunched it all up and then I shoved it in here. You could even put food inside of there. This could go to the, the guinea pig or the rabbit and a lot of the other animals too, maybe even um, all kinds of animals, right? But uh, just want to make sure that you know it's going to get destroyed. So if you give it to like a tortoise, they might eat it and that wouldn't be good for their tummy to get paper inside of their belly, right? So that's not good. We don't want to um, cause any kind of impaction. So this really wouldn't be a smart choice for a tortoise. They might just leave it alone, not do anything with it, and then you'd be fine. But if they decided to eat it and swallow it, then that wouldn't be good. But this, uh, this item is great for the animal coming up. So here is number one. Number two is just some packing paper in general. This is a bunch of wadded up pieces of packing paper, just kind of in wads. This can also apply to lots of animals. Sometimes we give the ferrets a, um, a box or a plastic bin full of a bunch of paper like that, and they will just basically go to town playing with each other and digging underneath. Ferrets like to dig, and they're natural diggers, so digging enrichment is really fun for ferrets. Uh, all of you guys that have ever had ferrets in your life, you know that. Um, but these can be used for all sorts of animals, including the ones coming right up. Boop, boop, boop. And then we have another toilet paper roll, which is cut up on the ends, and then I've um, kind of rearranged and pushed out the ends. That way it's kind of a fun little shape for them to mess with. And the last item, is an interesting one. It's actually a shell. This is a nice natural item, which is inexpensive as well. You can find shells at like pet stores. This is probably a hermit crab shell, but this can be given to small versions of what I'm going to show you. I wouldn't necessarily give this to a large version of the animal I'm going to show you, but for smaller um, species, it is perfectly okay. So what do you guys think this might be? Oh, you're so very close. William, you're doing great. So you are very, very, very close. And I'm going to go ahead and show you this animal. That way you know. Because we're running out of time, you guys. And here she comes. I'm going to get ready for her. It is a bird. It's not a cockatiel, but it's another small bird. So the seashell is fine. The uh, toilet paper rolls of all different types, as well as the paper. And all sorts of things can be used for this particular animal. Because they are extremely active animals. And they do require... Lots of enrichment to be satisfied in life. Come here. Oh, very good. This is a cute little bird. It's not a cockatiel, but it's R2-D2 the budgie. <laughs> oh, Pika, that was like a, a good guess. Yes. So it's R2-D2 today. She decided to come out today. And uh, she is a budgie, which is short for budgerigard, um, which is a type of parakeet from Australia. Uh, this species, the budgie, is found in Australia. Like I said, they're quite common there. And in the wild, they're not white and blue. They're actually green and yellow. But birds like R2-D2 here and many other birds that are commonly seen in households, as well as zoos all over the place, birds in general, even emus, need a lot of enrichment to stay active and uh, healthy and happy <laughs> and all those things. And to um, promote less negative behavior like plucking their feathers or biting or just being generally grumpy, um, having something to do in their life helps them quite a bit. And they're very, very intelligent animals for the most part. But even like our doves, who are not the most intelligent birds in the world, but they're still their own thing and they're super sweet and special. Um, those guys uh, really need a lot of enrichment as well. And they super enjoy the paper enrichment too. I think they like the paper enrichment more than any of our animals. Um, maybe the ferrets too. The paper, the, the paper is favored by the parrots. The parrots. The ferrets <laughs> and the parrots. The ferrets and the doves. The doves really enjoy making nest material out of the paper that they find around that I sometimes give them. And they'll make nests out of that and uh, whatnot. <laughs> pudgy. Ash says pudgy, but uh, they meant budgy, which you are right. <laughs> yes, a budgy. Budge? Pud? Budgy? Pudgy. <laughs> Very cute. You guys are wonderful. Yes, birds require a lot of enrichment. There are many types of bird toys that you can actually purchase at the store or online, um, but they can be items like I showed you already. They're super easy and inex inexpensive and biodegradable, Ricardo, items that you can give your birds. Even having her out here with some training is enriching as well and being on the show. She seems to really be comfortable out here, right? And she's getting her favorite snack, which are millet, millet seeds. Um, these are seed-eating animals in nature, and millet happens to be her very favorite snack. 
which is a type of seed as well. Isn't she sweet and cute? R2-D2 is actually one of our rescue animals. Uh, Shelton is actually a rescue as well, so we don't really know his age. We don't know R2's age either, but R2 seems like a very young bird. But what happened with her, in case you haven't heard her backstory, is we actually um, had her donated to us from a family that lives in Austin. We live in San Antonio, so it's a little bit, little bit away, but we met halfway. But what happened is uh, R2 actually uh, showed up in their backyard and uh, flew right up to them, kind of looking for help. <laughs> um, she was thankfully not clipped. Her wings are fully flighted and she could take off flying right now if she wanted to, but she's choosing to stay here for snacks. Um, but this animal just showed up in their backyard and thank goodness they were not clipped because she would have been surely eaten by a predator. These guys are full on prey animals in the wild and here in North America as well, where there's sometimes pets. Um, this is not a North American species, so they're not adapted to the predators we have at all. And if they can't fly, they can't get away. And if they don't have a group of budgies to live with, they can't hide in that group. So she would have been for sure probably taken by a predator. But luckily she had her wings and she could fly. She had all of her primary feathers, just like she has now. And she could fly right up to somebody who looked like they were um, somebody that could help her, I guess. <laughs> um, but she was very familiar with people. So I'm sure she was somebody's pet at some point, or at least was used to people in some way. And she's very young, so very sweet. Anyway, but uh, that is how we actually got R2-D2. She showed up in somebody's life, and then they offered her up to us because they weren't able to keep her forever. But a good Samaritan type story, which is kind of cool. Um, Ash asks, um, how does their personality differ from a cockatiel? Budgies are a lot more pushy and uh, kind of like a big bird in a small body because they have to be pushy like that in order to survive. They kind of have Napoleon complex. Um, so just like small dogs are a little bit more feisty, budgies are kind of like that too, but not with people. They're actually very sweet. Um, in my experience, budgies are pretty nice birds to have and, and keep. Um, but uh, as far as comparing it to a cockatiel, cockatiels are a lot more mellow for the most part and and uh, they're okay to just sit there and chill doing nothing or very easy to please in general and kind of minding their own business. And budgies will get right up in the other bird's faces and um, look for snacks and try to figure out what's going on. She doesn't mean any harm, but she really, you know, is trying to figure out how can she, how she can kind of benefit from what everybody else is doing. So they're, they're definitely um, big time survivors for their size. Um, and they have to be constantly moving, constantly looking for food, um, you know, trying to stay, stay alive out there in the wild. So that's where, where their nature kind of comes from. Very busy bodied, very, very, um, almost never sitting still. Um, not super loud. Cockatiels and budgies are about the same amount of loud. Um, budgies can actually talk a lot better than cockatiels. Evie talks a little bit, our male cockatiel, but, um, uh, budgies in general are much better talkers and mimickers. So they are different, but they're also similar in some ways. They're both in the parrot family. She's looking for more millet because she ate it all. Um, they're both in the parrot family. They're just small parrots. And they're both from Australia, which I find really interesting. And budgies and cockatiels can be seen living in uh, groups together, actually. They both form flocks of the same species together, their own species. But they also will form flocks uh, with mixed species as well. And you might see cockatiels and budgies flocking together in the wild too. Good question. Does she talk? Um, she does mimic some sound, but she doesn't really talk. Um, at least not yet, but remember she's very young. All right, you guys have some great, great questions. What uh, Ricardo asks, what are some of the most elaborate enrichments you've seen at zoos? There are so many to list. Maybe we'll do another second video on zoo enrichment and what I've done in the past. That would be a lot of fun. Here's another piece, darling, you can have it. Oh my goodness, I'm trying to arrange this with my finger so you can see her. Oh my gosh, here. Okay, you guys. But yes, I would love to talk about um, some more zoo experiences. I talked about generally how I feel about zoos and aquariums. And you guys should check out that video from our past. That is one of my favorite uh, topic videos that I ever did. But today we were just talking about some enrichment and giving you enrichment examples. I could literally talk all night long about enrichment, but I don't have a whole lot of time to spare. So I hope you guys understand, but it's been a lot of fun. And I really appreciate you guys joining us uh, today and always for our Wednesday once in a wild show each and every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Central time, of course. And thank you for joining us. And if you like what you see and you want to donate to Once in a Wild, there are several donation options down below, as well as our Amazon wish list at onceinawild.com. And also the best way to, of course, help us out is by booking your own animal encounter, whether they be in person Person in San Antonio, Texas, or virtually all over the world. So let me know if you're interested and we'll see you guys next time around. We are not
Okay, you guys, we'll see you next week here at Once in a Wild Wednesday.